Hi, everyone, and welcome to another podcast about building, aka growing a consulting firm or consulting practice. In today's episode, I want to talk about new clients. But before I do that, I also want to mention that this entire series is based on Obviously, the experiences we have had helping numerous boutique firms and even the offices of large firms and based on our personal experiences as well. Now, insiders, uh, our loyalty members, there is going to be an insider version of this program that is probably already launched by now. And what we do in that program is a little bit different. While we cover the same concepts, in that program, we are going to case study one fairly large, depending on what you call large, but a firm with about a $2 million of revenue and how we help them to significantly increase that revenue, change their client mix and so on. So in the insider version of this program, we're going to discuss one firm and show you each of the tools and techniques we used and how we took them through each step. And of course, if you are listening to this on iTunes, remember there is a YouTube version of this with graphics, right? So you can go to our YouTube channel. So let's just talk about clients, right? Quite important. We know sales is important. You can't do much without revenue, aka sales, coming in. Uh, You can have the best plans. You can have the most noble intentions. You can want to change the world. You want to maybe do things that are important to the well-being of your country. But unless you have revenue coming in, all of that is just an aspiration that will never see the light of day. So One of the first things I always tell clients who run, whether it's a firm whereby it's just one of them or a group of people or even an office of a large firm is you need to find clients and do it in a way that closes the sale fast. And you have to avoid what I call the um, layman's view of the way McKinsey, BCG and so on uh, does sales because the way they actually do sales is very different. But I'm not just here to talk you through how McKinsey closes sales because a lot of the things McKinsey or BCG does, you cannot do as a boutique firm. So I'm going to talk you through the things we've done with that client in the insider program and similar clients that are suitable for smaller organizations, organizations, consulting organizations that are different from the larger firms. So as a starting point, right, if you stick to the basics, finding clients is not difficult. But you must follow the plan of not acting like a large firm. So what do I mean by this? I'll tell you a little bit of an anecdote here. Uh, Many years ago when I was a partner, I was sent into the Latin American offices to help stabilize one of the offices. And I was working with quite a few of the others. As a resource partner, I had skills that clients that this office could serve would want. And I remember arriving there, came off a long flight, uh, lost my clothing, so I went to the office the next day uh, wearing the same clothing from my uh, long flight, which was about 17 hours, not feeling so good. And I had met everyone, and the, the partners were talking me through an analysis that they'd been working on for a fairly long time, led by some EMs and associates on clients they should target, sectors they could target to rebuild the practice. My feedback to them is that we already have a strategy. It's called an Amex card. And what I meant by that is that I'm not interested in sectors we should target, industries we should target, clients we need to get into, because let's focus on the clients we know, take them out for drinks and dinner, and focus on those clients. That's a common mistake I see most firms making. And people trying to build a consulting firm. They focus too much on clients they think they should be serving, and ignore potential clients they have access to. So in that situation, there was no market analysis, and there almost is no, never a market analysis. I've never seen a market analysis ever done with partners. What we do is we work on the relationships we have, and we start there. So if you're thinking, whom should I target? Which sectors, which industries? You're asking the wrong question. The correct question is, whom are the clients I know? And whom are the clients I can get a meeting with? Those are the clients you target, even if it's in a sector that you don't want to serve. In fact, there's no such thing as a sector you don't want to serve. Every sector, no matter what sector it is in the world, is going to have some segment of clients that's going to be attractive to you. Because if you're worried about clients, the first part is go for clients you can access. Go for clients you know, meet them. In another story, when I was serving, this is my first major client. And if you follow Rebuilding a Consulting Practice, Partnership Mentor, I talk about this client a lot. It's the client that made me. I ran the most important engagement at that client. But anyway, their offices, they had a very, very simple office. Uh, they believed in a, in a low overhead structure, small head office. Anyway, their head office, a resources client, was in this luxurious, high-end 
building complex with these fancy Italian and French restaurants on the lower level. So I would go and have a meeting with, uh, usually it was the chief financial officer or the chief operating officer. Sometimes the CEO was involved. Remember, I was just starting out here. I was still only an engagement manager at this stage, so I didn't have the access I had later on in my career. But anyway, I would meet these guys, 30 minute, one hour meeting, and then I would go to the Asian restaurant on the ground floor. So that every time people from the client were leaving, they'd have to pass the restaurant and they would see us. I'd be sitting there with another engagement manager who was running studies for me and we'd be having a four hour lunch and drinks. I mean, people from the office would see me. It didn't matter because what would happen then is every time an employee of the resources client would leave that I wanted to meet, I would invite them along and say, hey, you know what? It's a Friday evening. Why don't you join us for drinks? And that's basically how I did sales. There was no, I mean, there was some thinking involved and so on, but there was no PowerPoints and analysis of issues and so on, because as someone who's serving that client, I know the issues. It's not as if I'm serving a client I know nothing about and I got to do research. I know the issues. I've been working with them on operation strategy for a good few months. I've been being exposed to their financial strategy issues and all kinds of things. So when I see an employee I know and an employee I want to meet, I just pull them over and say, hey, why don't you have a drink with us? It's Friday evening. I mean, and someone will say, well, i got to go home. I promised my kids. And I'll say, just one drink. We'll have one drink. And of course, it turns in like 10 drinks. By the end of that, I can't walk. So i got to sit there for another three hours while I have coffee and you know, get to the point where I can't drive home. But my point is that forgetting how you meet clients, the most important thing is meet clients you can serve. Forget about everyone else, right? Now, this thing about offering to demonstrate your skills for four days, AK free, is something we used as well. You know, if you follow rebuilding a consulting practice, I moved to a badly performing emerging markets office. I had a chance to go to London. I had a chance to go to Boston. I turned them all down and I went to a pretty terrible office. And I remember that the associate principal who groomed me to become a partner, what he would do is would call up people you knew in the executive offices of resources clients, clients we wanted to serve. They were not yet our clients. They were clients of the firm, but not but this particular branch of that client was not being served by our office. So we'd call them up and sometimes it was the head office as well because there were a lot of resources companies in the area and say, you know what, we know it's Christmas time. Why don't we send one of our top people to work with you, think through issues and, you know, see what happens. It's free, but he would never say that. You'd call it a secondment or whatever he wants, you know, because we're trying to work with clients and see what could happen. And I would be deployed and later when I became more senior and became a partner, I would do that with some of my top people. The point is that it's basically five days, continuous access to clients. You're doing work for free. But what is the alternative? Sit in an office and send them emails, send them proposals? No. So at the end of this, I've never been in a situation where it never led to some work. Maybe the work came immediately. Sometimes the work came three months later. Sometimes it led to a significant improvement in the relationship, but it always led to us doing work. And what we would do in those four or five weeks, we would do one of two things. We'd either sketch out an issue that required us to do an analysis, or we'd identify an issue and say, you know what, we think we know what we need to do to fix this, but why don't we do a short two-week pilot with just two people, obviously it's paid, and then that would lead to billable work. And then that would lead to implementation. So when, whenever I look at firms and they talk about how they're going to do the studies and this analysis, that's for clients you do not know. Now, for clients you do not know, easiest thing in the world is to do a survey of supply chain issues in their sector, anything. Do a study, right? Firms invest in intellectual property. Do some kind of study for this, of the sector. Do an analysis. Do a, a, a summary. Develop a new approach. Do some benchmarks or whatever it is. And then use it as an opportunity to meet an executive to talk about what you find in the sector. That's how you meet clients you do not know. All of this can be done cheaply and quickly. Here's the interesting thing. In the insider version of the program, we're going to talk about that one client we work with, which is representative of other clients as well. But the interesting thing for them is that this area of work generated eventually over 50% of their revenues when we were done with them because we wanted them to diversify away from revenue that was purely generated from billable hours. It was difficult because quite a few of them were ex-McKinsey and so on, so they had this view that consulting is pure, it must only be billable hours. So focus on clients you know, that's the most important thing, right? 
Now, if you're watching this video, listening to this on iTunes, and you want to see some of the more advanced stuff we do, go to firmsconsulting.com, F-I-R-M-S-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G.com. And if you register for free or put your name into the opt-ins or pop-ups, we will send you sample videos of some of the advanced stuff we do. Now, as you go through this program, remember this, right? It's all about going after the clients you have access to, even if you've sent them for a long time. Now, that's why I always tell firms, serve larger clients. Because if you finish one engagement with them, there's always a chance something else will be coming up. If you serve a smaller client, the odds are they're going to be doing less consulting work. And there's less for you to move on to. So how are you approaching your current clients? How many meetings have you arranged? How will you lower resistance? What are you going to do to get them to speak to you? And then the other category, which is for later down the line, but you've got to start pursuing it now, is how do you get to clients you do not have access to but you want to know. So let's do a bit of a wrap up here, right? So let's tie this together, right? Some of the lessons. Now, this applies to new, young, small consulting offices, smaller offices, but it also applies to large offices. These are techniques I used when I was at the firm and I had to go after big, multi-billion dollar clients. When you had to turn around offices with 70 people, 120 people. The first thing is that you should not spend your days and weeks developing a strategy for how you're going to serve a client and how you're going to grow the firm because you just don't know enough about the market and you cannot afford to burn so much hours on something that's really an expense. You've got to go out there, meet clients, and as you talk to them, you will find out what their issues are. Having two associates sitting in an office reading annual reports to find out a company's issues is really a hit and miss. If you sit with a client for an hour, you're going to find out more than anything anyone could ever do in the office to prepare you for that meeting. Don't get bogged down with complex sales presentations. This is something that people tend to forget about the major firms. We generally didn't have complex presentations. Because of our reputation, we could put together very simple presentations and get the work. But because you usually don't have a reputation as a younger, smaller office and smaller firm, you should position yourself as someone who can get bankable results. Don't talk about implementation. It's such a cliche. Don't talk about implementation. Implementation is not the same as bankable results. You can implement something and not get the results you promised. Bankable results says you hire us, you will get this. But if you talk about implementation, it doesn't mean you can get bankable results. A lot of implementation fails. Focus on the clients you know. Offer to, you know, basically, even if they don't agree to free work, go to them four days, five days in a row and talk to them. Help them develop issues. You know, I've been in situations where I remember the CEO of a very important client lady wanted to work with us, didn't really like the firm so much, but she liked me. And she would call me and I would go every day. I went to see her for something like a week. Obviously, I didn't bill her for anything. I would sit in her office. She had a nice lounge. And I'd do work for her, help her think through issues. When meetings came up, she'd go for the meeting. She'd come back. We'd talk about things. That led to an incredibly important mandate for the firm to work for a client that we really wanted to work for because it was a very prestigious client. That is the same thing as working for free, but you can see you can be creative in the way you do it. Meetings five days in a row where you're thinking through issues, providing updates, and that's free work, but we don't talk about it. We don't call it free. If you want to meet new clients and you have a great reputation, it's going to be easy. But if you don't have a great reputation, then do some kind of free work analyzing the sector and present the results. And finally, the goal is always to create sustainable revenue streams and not follow traditional consulting models. I may talk about this more, but in the insider version, we definitely talk more about breaking the revenue streams because it's just tiring and demoralizing to go through these sales slumps whereby you don't have revenue coming in for billable work, right? And of course, you've got to ask yourself how you're spending your day because it should be in front of clients. So if you have any questions or comments, post a response on iTunes or YouTube. As always, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.